Good morning, everybody. It is a joy to be here today with you. Uh, what a privilege for us to uh, be able to come and share on your anniversary, 25 years. I've lived a lot more than 25 years, so that seems like a very short time frame, actually. So, But I wanted my wife to take just a couple minutes to talk about Ukraine and our um, exit. So go ahead, dear. Yes. Um, greetings to you. Um, in Russian, you'd say, that means happy birthday. Even for a church. Yes, for a church. They don't say anniversary. It's ha happy birthday. And their church is normally, they celebrate their birthday every year, the church does. And so there's always a church in Ukraine celebrating their birthday, it seems like. Um, but we are glad to be here in a sense. <laughs> we would rather be in Ukraine, but God did not make it that way. Um, we were never in harm's way. Um, that we know of. That we know of. Um, our city was quiet, and most of the cities that we are ministering to in Ukraine have been quiet. Um, just last week, our city, um, they, the Russians destroyed a factory in town, but that's all we know of so far. And uh, But when we felt like God wanted us to stay, but yet we were going to come into the authority of our leadership, and the day that um, the war started, our leadership asked us to leave. And so we took a couple days to pack and to get ready and to leave. So Saturday morning, early in the morning, we started to leave. And it takes us 11 hours drive to get from where we live to the Romanian border because Ukraine is about the size of Texas. And then we were stopped three hours at a checkpoint that we didn't know we would have to go through. And then when we started getting close to the Ukra um, Ukrainian-Romanian border, all of a sudden we got a line of cars. So 10 to 12 miles away from the Romanian border, we got in line in cars. And it took us two and a half days of going two or three car lengths at a time to get out of Ukraine. And thank God, I always bring enough food more than enough. More food. than enough food. So we had food, but the Red Cross was along the side of the road too and gave us some snacks and food and water. Even though we really didn't need it, it was a really nice thing. And um, if you can imagine, we did not, we were afraid that we wouldn't have enough gas, so we turned off the car between here. Um, and then we'd start it back up and go a little while and then turn it back off again. And it was the end of February, wasn't it? Or it was. We left February 26th, and we got into Romania morning of March 1st. So, yes. And so it was cold still. And so I think God was talking to me while we were packing to bring a couple blankets, and I did not listen. In I her thought, great wisdom, yes, I she thought, decided not to bring we blankets. We didn't need it. And so it got a little cold in the car at night. And um, probably too much information, but the practical thing is somebody, we always had to take turns sleeping because somebody always had to pull the car forward when, it, when the line went forward. And you're, there's a few little towns along the way, but most of the time you're out in the middle of nowhere. And so the only place to go to the bathroom is behind the trees and the bushes. And it's different when the traffic's going fast and nobody's watching you, but when everybody's sitting still, and during the day, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees that were walking along the side of the road also. Where they were coming from, I don't know. It might have been a train or a bus station or someplace, but there were students from India and Africa and families, and you could only take what you could carry. And there was a lot of men bringing their families to the border, but men from the age of 18 to 60 couldn't, cannot leave Ukraine. They can do something to help in the war. And unless you have three small children, or four children or more, or a single dad or something like that, you cannot leave the country. And so they would bring their families to the border and drop them off 
and then come go back home. So there was many guys coming back the opposite way by themselves. And that is a really hard situation to look to watch. And um, God was with us, though. And we got a little bored and a little silly sometimes. We talked about uh, burying our bare buns behind the bare bushes because it's, it's winter, so there were no leaves on those bushes and those trees. <laughs> I mean, and um, being next to the person next to you go to the bathroom also. And, but God is faithful, and he was with us the whole time, and um, we just praised God. After we got over the border, we went to another colleague, another missionary in Romania, went down to Constanza, which is the sea, so we had seven southern and a Romania. half hours, yeah. southern Romania, so we had seven and a half hours of travel after that, and so. All, all told, we were in the car 82 hours. 82 hours, so it was just a pain, but thank God that we are here now, and that we just pray that God would use us here and that he would eventually tell us his plan for our lives. We are really praying and believing that we will be able to go back to Ukraine because I believe after this time of turmoil and war that God will bring a great revival to Ukraine, that people nowadays are more receptive to the gospel in Ukraine than they ever have before. We. We are in constant contact, or at least he is, Hi. because he knows Russian a lot better than I do, um, with the pastors and the people, and we are funneling money to them personally um, to know exactly what they're doing with the money and how they're ministering. And we had a praise report just a couple of weeks ago, and I'll let you tell okay. that, and I'll say we thank you for letting us be here and being a part of your celebration. Yeah. We, we have some pastor friends that live in the northeast part of Ukraine, and they go into the areas that have been bombed or have, where the Russians are very, very close over in Sumy and Kharkiv, area, Kharkiv areas. And they, one pastor told me that just a week and a half ago, they went and they brought in supplies. And what I do a lot of times, they'll bring supplies in and take people out to rescue them from their difficult places. But this, this one particular, they, they brought in supplies, then they shared the gospel with 30 to 50 people who were there, and every person there repented and gave their life to Christ. That's amazing. Because you don't, you don't see that very often, and so that's just amazing. Uh, one of those two pastors wrote to me the other day and said, I have no money to buy diesel. Uh, and so I told him, Monday I'll send you some money. I got, got some money ready to send to you, so I'll get that taken care of. And, uh, just, and they can't, because if they can't buy diesel, they can't go anywhere. Uh, it's, uh, they might have the supplies, but they can't go anywhere. And so, uh, and that's actually been a difficult thing, finding gas, diesel, uh, to be able to run any kind of machines. Uh, you, uh, I should say cars and trucks and stuff like that, because I talked to one guy in the city about two hours from where we lived, and they had no gas, no diesel, no nothing in their city. And they would be people who would wait five hours in line to buy gas, only to get turned away, and they don't have any left. So... Uh, it's, it's tough. And that was one of the concerns as we were leaving, especially for Denise, was that uh, if we are unable to buy gas, how are we going to actually make it from our home to the border and to get out of the country? But God provided, as he always does. Uh, he's, a, he's a good God. He's a great God, you know. And he takes care of us even when we don't... Um, we don't understand what it is we ourselves need. Even before we know the need is there, he's already got a plan ready. He's not caught off guard. I love what Dan Betzer used to say, was that God's not up in heaven and sees that Phil has a tragedy and he goes, oh no, what am I going to do now? God already knew what he was going to do about that. And the same thing is true for your life. So, But happy anniversary, happy 25th anniversary. That's just amazing. Exciting time for celebration, and uh, thank you, Pastor Gary, for the invitation. I, you could have picked a whole lot of better preachers than I, than I am, um, but uh, we are just grateful for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, I want to start out and just take a moment for us to honor Pastor Gary and Carrie for their faithfulness. Uh, yeah. 
To be in one place for 25 years is very rare. It really is, and it, it's just amazing, and it's a testimony to them and their faithfulness, and God's faithfulness to them in return. And Denise and I, we love and appreciate you both. We're just so grateful for your friendship, and uh, I believe the best days of this church are ahead. And it doesn't mean that you guys are going anywhere. It just means that God has good plans for you guys as well as the church. And together, the church is going to continue to move forward. So that's just exciting. Uh, when I started thinking about how much has changed in 25 years, I thought, uh, I'll do a little bit of research and share some things with you about the year 1997, some highlights that I found. Bill Clinton and Al Gore started their second term as president and vice president of the United States that year. Google.com was registered as, as a domain name, which means before 97, there was no Google. Can you, any more, can you imagine life without Google? Most of us cannot. Uh, the Women's Bas National Basketball Association started. The United Kingdom handed so sovereignty of Hong Kong to China in 1997. The Woolworth Company closed after 117 years in business. The three biggest films of the year were Titanic, The Lost World Jurassic Park, and Men in Black. Seinfeld was the top TV show that year, which was in its last season that year. Beanie Babies became the latest must-have toys. The Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl. The Florida Marlins won the World Series. Tiger Woods became the youngest golfer to ever win the Masters. Actors Brian Keith and Rich Robert Mitchum, singers John Denver and Jimmy Rogers, along with Christian musician Rich Mullins, Mother Teresa, explorer Jacques Cousteau, Diana, Princess of Wales, all died in 1997. Feels like a long time ago now, doesn't it? A gallon of milk cost $1.90. Unemployment was 5.4%, while inflation averaged 2.5%. Median household income was $37,000, and this one's going to hurt. The average price of a gallon of gas was $1.22. Oh, for the good old days, right? But don't ever forget, the best days for all of us are ahead. doesn't matter what the economy does. doesn't matter if there's war in the world. doesn't matter if we had to scratch something that was not off our bucket list, off our bucket list, to fleeing a country at war. It doesn't matter about all those things because God is on the throne. He has everything under control. Without the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit, this church would not exist and would not have been possible. God spoke to Pastor Gary and Carrie, and they obeyed, stepping out in faith, going from what was a very comfortable place to a very uncomfortable place. We know a little bit about that. The good part was when they went from Palisade to Cross Lake, Everybody still spoke English. When we went from America to Ukraine, hardly anybody spoke English. So we had to learn their heart language instead. God provided, and now you have this beautiful building, and it's being used for his glory. But God's provision did not mean this building simply dropped from heaven into place. It meant that Many hours of prayer had to take place. Many, many hours of work and many financial gifts that all came together to make this building possible. And, of course, the church is not a building. The church is us, the body of Christ. What a privilege to be part of the family of God. But without God, nothing would have happened here. Only God could have orchestrated the things that Pastor Gary was sharing about. Only God, and to him be the glory. As I tell my guys in Ukraine often, that we need to pray as though it all depends on God, and work as though it all depends on us. And I am confident that's how this church was started, and that's how it continues to function. Nothing happens without effort on our part, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit makes our efforts productive and effective. Just think of all the people who have come and gone through the doors of this church in 25 years at the community center and since you got here. Just think of 
the many lives that were touched, many people who were changed. Saw a testimony of that just in the short video we watched. I hopefully you are among those that have been touched and changed because of this church being here. And hopefully you've helped touch the lives of other people who have come here and have helped them change. And just imagine how many more lives will be touched in the next 25 years, should the Lord tarry. That's exciting. The first 25 years of a church is still like a young person, okay? That just still it's in its youth. And yet it's, those are the years when the foundation is laid, preparing it for what God wants to do with the church beyond those 25 years. Many of us here are well above 25 years old, right? And for us, that's just a drop in the bucket. It's le- for me, it's less than half a lifetime. That's actually scary to think about. But let's take a moment right now and pray to pray and thank God for this church and for showing his faithfulness in and through this church. God, we thank you for Cross Lake Christian Assembly of God that you spoke to Pastor Gary and Terry, and that they obeyed and moved here and did what you asked them to do and stepped out in faith to start this work, God. And I know that they did not do this, but you did it through them, God. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for your faithfulness over the last 25 years. We thank you for this beautiful building. We thank you, God, for each person who is here who has been touched by this church, many who helped build this building, God. The testimony of God's, your protection while they were building. We just thank you, God, that you are so faithful. You always provide. You never let us down, God. Speak to us today, God, in your precious name. Amen. Uh, All churches go through seasons, and I'm sure that this church is no exception. In some seasons, it's very easy. Other seasons, it's really hard. In some seasons there's plenty, while in other seasons there seems to be only lack. But through all those seasons, God is always the good provider. And he never changes. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today, just like he was 25 years ago, just like he was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't matter. He never changes. And that fact does not change based on our circumstances or the circumstances of the church. He's still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's still good. No one church excels at everything. But most churches have several things that they do well. Uh, We already heard one of them, bluegrass. I have to say that is very unique. I, I have not been in very many churches that have bluegrass, bluegrass concerts, okay? That, that is very unique, and I've never been to a bluegrass concert, I admit, but we're going to stay today to enjoy it, so. Um, but there are two other specific things that I have seen that this church does well. The first thing is that this church does a good job of participating at various district events. Pastor Gary and Carrie, they are involved in things. Um, And to our knowledge, they are always at family camp, along with other people from the church. We love family camp. That's the thing we miss the most when we're overseas, is family camp. Don't tell our families that, but that's true. Um, And when our girls were younger, there were always kids and youth at camps from here. And there was always a group from Cross Lake at Girls Camp Out, which my wife simply loves. Many other churches are not like that at all whether bigger or smaller. The second thing that this church does well is missions. Our family is just one of the missionaries who have been blessed by this church and your partnership. And I know there's however many pictures on the wall, 10 or 11, whatever it is, I didn't count. But those pictures haven't been the only ones that have ever been on the wall. There's other missionaries who are no longer missionaries who are no longer on the wall, but you guys partnered with them just like you partnered with us. We were here for services in 2012, 2013. 
I really felt bad then, but I really needed this service. And I called Pastor Gary in 2013. I said, you don't even have to give us an offering. I'll just come and preach because I need to have a service. It was December. And I need that. Oh, no, well, you can come. And then, of course, he writes me a check anyway. I'm like, no, 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 you weren't supposed to do that. But that's their heart. They do missions well. And in 2019, I was here without Denise. And while we were here in 2012, we stayed at one of our favorite places during all of our itineration travels when we stayed in that garage, uh, apartment above the garage. It's at, over by one of the lakes around here nearby. Just fantastic place. And, and we just really liked that setup. It was just wonderful. And you started partnering with us financially in 2014, and you've increased your commitment three times since then. In just eight years. Thank you. Many other churches do not have the same heart for missions, no matter their size. I've been to big churches, and we have received an $800 offering. I'm talking churches with two or three services. I've never gotten less than $500 for this, because you have a heart for missions. Out of the just over 90 churches who have committed to partner with us financially, this church, your church, is the only one who purchased things that we needed and other things that we wanted and then sent a package to us in Ukraine during our last term. You're the only ones who have ever done that. For us, it was just like Christmas when we got it. And the fact that you cared about us enough to do that touched us and ministered to our hearts. And we'll never forget that kindness. So thank you. Ephesians 4.16 says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I believe that this verse describes God's plan for the local church and how it should function. The first thing is that we have to recognize God's responsibility in the church. The verse starts out, He, God, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. The global church exists because God created the church, and God still creates the local church and uses it for His glory when the local church is run under the direction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be part of any other church. that is, If they're not run by the direction and anointing of the Holy Spirit, I, for, I'm not going to go there. I want to find a church that's alive, where the Spirit of God is able to move. The church is the body of Christ. Acts 17.28 tells us that as His body, in Him we live and move and exist, or the King James, and have our being both individually as people and corporately as a church. And both we and the church were created to bring glory to the name of the Lord. Denise and I remind ourselves regularly when we're in Ukraine, it's not about us. It's not about us. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter if we go to a church that has no heat or uh, an outdoor toilet that's only a hole in the floor. It doesn't matter because it's not about us. Literally, we were in January, we were in a church that nobody turned the heater on. There's only one heater for this rectangular building. They turned it on when we got there, just before service started. We were there for over two hours. The building never got warm. I wanted to preach with my gloves on and my hat, hat on my head, but I didn't. I took my gloves off, but it was so cold. I don't think it was hardly 40 degrees in there. Uh, and Denise sat back by the heater most of the time, and it wasn't even warm by the heater, basically. So uh, we actually had ate supper there and stuff like that, but yeah, it was cold. And we as Americans, you know, if we don't have comfort, we're not going to go to church. Got to have heat, got to have air conditioning, got to have, you know, comfy chairs. I've been in churches where they have benches, and they're very uncomfortable. But people go. You just keep your coat on. If it's cold, it's not a big deal. But we were created for God's glory because it's all about him and not about us. How important for each of us and for the church to ask 
about the things that we have done, the things that we're planning to do, did that or will that bring glory to God? Of course, the local church is made up of imperfect people. Anybody here perfect? I'm not. My wife's almost. And we are all in the process of being sanctified. Which means that the church as we see it is far from perfect. But that's okay. Because the verse in Ephesians does not say that the church is perfect, but that he makes the whole body, all the parts of the body, to fit together perfectly. So his design is perfect. Not necessarily the execution of the imperfect body. I look around the room and all of our bodies are not perfect, are they? My wife has thyroid issues, which affects her health. I had cancer. I didn't have any say in that. But, so my, our bodies are not perfect, but it's okay because we're going to have glorified bodies someday. Perfect, healthy bodies. Jesus died to save us and we need each other. Do you know that? You need the church, and the church needs you because you're one of those parts that needs to fit in. And God uses people in our lives to change us. Anybody have any people like that, that uh, in your life that really are difficult to be around? They're a messenger from God to help you to develop your character to become more like Jesus. Nobody likes to hear that, but it's true. God uses those people to change us. And God is working on us with the intention of us fitting together better. Because when we're imperfect, we can't fit in the design. But as we become more like Jesus... We fit together better, more like the plan, more like the design, as we become more like Christ. It is God's responsibility to build, to lead, to empower, and to grow the church. That doesn't mean we just sit down and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, you're going to build the church. You're going to bring the sinners in. No, we have to do our part. There was an old song that used to say, bring them in, right? Bring them in from the fields of sin. We have to bring people to the cross. That's our job. And we as individuals also have a responsibility in the church. And this, my second point is you have to recognize your personal responsibility. The verse continues, as each part does its own special work. What that means to me is that every person has a special task to do in the church and that there is no place for spectators in the kingdom of God other than to cheer our brothers and sisters in Christ on while we're doing our special work. Unlike a sporting event where only certain members of a team are on the field or on the court at the same time, on God's team, we all have a role to fill. He expects us to do our special work with everything we had, not just, okay, I'm here, I'm going to do my job for Jesus. No, it's, I'm here, I'm going to do my job for Jesus with everything I have. In Colossians 3.23 we read, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Sometimes we forget that in the church we are working for the Lord. At work, we are working for the Lord. At home, we are working for the Lord. But especially in the church, we're not working for the pastor. We're not working for his wife. We're not working for the leaders. We're not even working for our spouse. We are doing our special work that God gave us because it is my responsibility, it's your responsibility in the church to do what God gave you to do. And we also should not do the work of the Holy Spirit by saying to our brother or sister, I think God has, wants you to do this job, unless you're sure that it's from the Lord. 
Amen? The last part of Hebrews 12.1 says, Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. It does not say, let some of us run. But it says, let us run. That is implied all of us. The race is not for just a few, but it's for all of us. It is important that we all participate by doing the special work that God prepared for us to do. When God fulfills his responsibility, and he always does, and when each one of us fulfills our responsibility, then we will see exciting results. So my third point is, recognize the results. And what are the results we're looking for? Growth. Our verse continues. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That is the plan of God, my friends. And it is the desire of his heart. Growth. A healthy, growing body. A body full of love for each other. And that should be what we're looking for as well. But what kind of growth is God looking for? He's looking for spiritual growth, first and foremost. He wants each one of us individually to grow to be more like Jesus and to know his heart deeper and better. We need to spend time every day in the spiritual disciplines of reading the Bible, praying, and worshiping God. Every day. It has always been important for us to attend church every or nearly every Sunday. But the Bible says, especially as we see that day approaching, Jesus coming. It's also important for us to grow our, to share our faith with others. And that is another way that we grow spiritually. Because then you share your faith and somebody has a question. You don't know the answer. You've got to look it up or ask somebody else who can help you. And it doesn't matter how much of an introvert you or I might be. We still need to be sharing our faith. And I'm going to tell you, I am a huge introvert. We are living in Iowa City most of the time with my uh, wife's sister, because that's where her parents are, and her parents are 90 years old. About seven weeks ago, her mom fell and broke her femur, uh, right leg here, so she had a rod in there that fit perfectly into her artificial knee so that you didn't have to have a cast on it and stuff. So, um, so we're just there just so the knees can be closer to, to them and help out. But uh, I go to the gym almost every day, uh, Planet Fitness in Iowa City, and there was a young guy that I saw there over a period of several weeks, and I heard God say to me, you need to go talk to him. And I said, what am I supposed to say? And God didn't tell me what to say. Just go talk to him. And there would be times we'd be in the locker room alone because I was looking for the ideal time, nobody else around. You you understand me, right? You've all been there. Uh, God, when you set it up perfectly, then I'll know it's your will, and then I'll do it, right? And and every time I was about ready to talk to him, somebody else came in the locker room. I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. And uh, he had his earbuds in all the time when he was working out. I didn't want to bother him. And so I knew the college year was coming to an end, and... One of the days that I was there was the last day that I would be able to probably see him until after graduation. If, if he wasn't around, then I'd never see him again. And so I actually didn't get a chance to talk to him. I, I didn't make a chance, I guess. And I got in my car and started driving out of the parking lot. And I went, oh, this is so dumb. And I went and parked the car, went back inside, told the guy at the front, I forgot something. He said, OK, no problem. Didn't tell him what I forgot. And I went back there, and I found the guy. And I tapped him on the shoulder, he took out his earbud, and I said to him, Hi, my name is Phil, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I believe God wants me to talk to you. Because I had nothing. My heart was beating terribly, because I'm an introvert. And we talked for about less than a minute. But I found out his name, Will. I found out that um, he doesn't believe in a deity, he told me that right away. Found out he was studying pre-law. He was a senior, so he was going to finish studying at the University of Iowa. And then he told me, maybe, your God wants, maybe God wants you to talk to me because I'm going to be a lawyer for the Satanic Temple. That was in the first 20 seconds of my conversation. 
And I thought to myself, wow, God gave me the answers through his lips. That is very interesting. And so now I pray for him. I say, God, bring somebody into his life or let him come. I saw him at the gym recently too, and I was surprised to see him. I gave him my contact information. He seemed glad to have that. So we'll see if he ever reaches out to me. But now we're friends on Facebook too. But it's one of those things where uncomfortable, yes. But it's not about me. I have to share my faith because, not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a missionary, because I'm a Christian. And God wants us to share our faith with others. And when we do that, we will see spiritual growth in us. When we do all those things, we'll see spiritual growth in ourselves, in others, and in the body of Christ, the church. Last October and again in January, Denise and I hosted a mini-retreat for young men in our home uh, we only have six places to sleep, so we wanted up to six guys. We only had three the first time and four the second time, and that was perfectly fine. But they, most of them came on Friday and left on Sunday afternoon with lots of time for fellowship, food, fun, and lots of time in God, God's Word. My wife fed us very well, and as always, they loved the American food that she prepared. Because she doesn't know how to make Ukrainian food, so she makes American food, and they think they are in heaven. They call her a master chef, and what she is is a good Midwest wife that knows how to cook hot dishes and stuff like that. So, uh, but one of the young men who came in January is a pastor's son. When I talked about the daily habit of Bible reading, he admitted that he rarely, if ever, read his read his Bible at the time. Of course, I encourage all of them to get in the habit of daily Bible reading, and it doesn't matter when I preach to youth if it's. What I'm preaching about, I always talk about how important it is to read your Bible because without that, you, you miss out on the bread of life. Your spirit just dies of hunger. And so the ones, if they weren't doing that, I encourage them to read their Bible every day. And recently I asked him how often he's reading the Bible. He said almost every day. And then I asked him, have you noticed any spiritual growth in your life? And he said, definitely Yes. I'm like, praise God. That's what I love to hear. A life that was changed because we took time to do a lot of work for four guys, my wife especially. She worked a lot harder than I did. But we took time to feed four guys, spiritually and physically, and it changed their lives. That's, That's what it's all about. And how did that happen? It's because my wife and I, as members of the body of Christ, were being obedient to God and fulfilling the special work that he gave each of us to do. And then my young friend started disciplining himself to read the Bible after being with us. And spiritual growth is a natural result. Ephesians 4.16 means to me That if each one of us in the church does our part, that is the special work that God gives each of us to do, under the direction and anointing of the Holy Spirit, then there will be spiritual growth and the whole body will be healthy and growing. And best of all, the body will be full of love. God's love. And what does the Bible say? Other people will know that we're followers of Jesus by the love we have for each other. Beautiful picture. Growth should be a normal part of life, both physically and spiritually. Of course, as adults, we hopefully stop growing, right? Because once you get to be over 25, the only way is going out, not up. So, um, yeah. What about numerical growth? Is that important? Well, it is at some level. But I believe the church will grow numerically if we all start doing the special work that God gave us to do. And if each of us does our part to grow spiritually on a continual basis, then the church will grow. Because I believe the more Christ-like the people in the church become, the more attractive the church becomes to other people. I've been in places where there was infighting in the church, and it's just nasty. I couldn't invite a friend to go there because I just I wouldn't I'd be embarrassed. Numerical growth is much less important than spiritual growth, and too many pastors and churches 
have focused on numbers and missed out on God's plan. In Ukraine, over several years, I've gone from having a cell group of more than 14 people to just four or five most of the time. Why? Because I did not see spiritual growth in the large group. I saw too many guys coming to just sit, hear something, but with no interest in growing, no interest in feeding themselves the Bible. So instead, I changed my cell group to a discipleship group and limited to those who wanted to grow in Christ. So I've got five guys that come almost all the time who are faithful and they are wanting to grow in Christ. Two of those five guys were filled with the Holy Spirit at, the church, at their church service just two days before my last cell group, the week the war started. Think about that. And they were so excited they had to write me and call me to tell me. So I'm like, praise God. Um, but I want to see growth. I don't just want to see people, numbers. To me, that's not important. I'd much rather see growth. As we each fulfill our special task from God, it motivates other people to fulfill their special task from God. And the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more important it is for us to gather in the church as often as we can. Today we're here to celebrate the milestone of 25 years for this church. Thank God for his help, his faithfulness, that brought this church to this milestone. Because without the Holy Spirit, this church wasn't going to last 25 years. It wasn't going to last two years. But we don't want to simply look back. We want to look ahead to what God has in store. And I want to challenge each of you as people who call this church your home. Will you dedicate yourselves to the journey ahead to fulfill your special work from God with everything you have and to pray and to work for the kingdom of God with even more earnestness and more desire for spiritual growth than you've ever had before. If you will do that, this church will not only continue, but it will thrive and it will grow both spiritually and numerically. And that's what I want to see. That's my heart. Anywhere I go, it doesn't matter if it's in America or Ukraine, my desire is for the church to grow spiritually and then numerically so. Keep your focus on the command that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. It says there, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Keep doing missions well, locally and globally. And God will bless you for it. Let's pray. God, I thank you, God, for this church. God, I thank you for what you have done, what you're going to do. I thank you for the lives that have been touched and changed because this church exists, God. I pray that you would help them to continue to bless the community, to continue to grow spiritually, and the other things will follow, God. Bless Pastor Gary and Carrie, God. Uh, we just thank you for them, Lord. We just thank you for your faithfulness. In your name, amen.